Okay, I'm going to get started. Today we begin Lecture Module 4, which corresponds to Chapter 4 in the textbook in Linux Lab 4. Chapter 4 presents input and output. In my opinion, it's probably one of the easiest chapters in the text. It's We're familiar with all the technology that's presented in the text. And having stated that, the text is dated. So while today will be very straightforward and even a short lecture, tomorrow we're going to look at new emergent input and output technologies and it is it'll leave you awestruck so i'm going to actually begin i want to jump back to lecture module two the main page here because there are a couple things that we need to understand this is not in the text when we look at information input and output it's proper to introduce digital rights management, DRM. And we're all familiar with that. Of course, the ethics, we should not copy movies and share them, we should not copy songs and share them. So we're all, we're, all, we're all familiar with this. But we need to understand there is a fundamental difference between the physical items and information. So looking at this, physical items wear out. They're replicated at the expense of the manufacturer. So what does this mean? Well, we can reverse engineer a car. It's, it's fairly straightforward. However, to, the cost to reproduce it is expensive. To set up a plant would actually be very expensive to do. Physical items exist at a tangible location. And when sold, of course, the seller no longer owns the thing. You sell your car, you no longer have it. Very different from information. Information never wears out. It can't become obsolete or untrue. I could look at some of these old Microsoft Windows 3.1, Microsoft Windows 95, okay? So it's just no longer useful. Can be replicated at virtually no cost without limit, right? I can copy files as I see fit. Exists in the ether. When sold, the seller still retains the information. Now this may still be useful to the owner or maybe not. In the case of if I rip, an M, you know, rip a CD and send out MP3 files, I still have that CD. It's still useful to me. I can still listen to it. Same thing with movies. However, if I look at a, say, Windows 7 installation disk, I can copy it and sell it to someone. But as soon as they install it and activate it, Microsoft will know that there are two copies and one of them is unofficial. So again, there are some constraints here. Information is costly to produce, but we've already understood that it's cheap to reproduce. So pricing is based on the based on this on the cost to recover the sunk cost. Okay. So if I look at say, what am I going to sell a movie for? Well, what did it cost to make the movie? How many do I intend to distribute? So moving on to input and output. This is not in the text. I'm going to introduce it now, and you are responsible for it. Again, the textbook presents technology, information systems. But it doesn't go so far to really understand or present, and it can't, the overall social context of what we're doing. The technology acceptance model was, was derived to indicate why some technology is adopted by people and some is not. It's based on two dimensions, perceived usefulness and perceived ease of use. If there's a very low perceived ease of use, everyone just adopts it if it's useful. The, the iPad, right? There's almost no learning curve to the iPad. Two-year-olds, one-year-olds can stroll, scroll through photo albums. Not a problem. But if there's a steep learning curve, and as an example, I'll look at computer-aided design. Anybody ever do computer-aided CAD? OK. How steep was that learning curve? Um, pretty bad. It's like a brick wall. It's like vertical. Who's going to use it? Is the average person going to start using CAD off the street? No. There's, they don't see any usefulness to it. However, if you look at, say, certain professionals, if you look at an architect, if you look at an engineer, they realize that, yes, if I learn how to use computer-aided design, the software I can have a better finished product. I can share, I can communicate this information better. So typically we'll see professionals 
if there's a steep or a high perceived ease of use, over professionals will overcome this if they see perceived usefulness. The second is, the, this is just an H, HCI 10, and I will not ask this question on a test. But if the user cannot find the functionality, it may as well not exist. Throughout the course of time, there's been, there have been a lot of technological advances. But if the person can't see how to use it, what's the purpose of it? So we'll look at this even more when we get to web design. Keyboards. Again, with this chapter, it's things we're all familiar with. I'm not going to present too much new today. Tomorrow will be very different. Tomorrow is one of the best presentations of the semester. It's just fun. So I know everyone here has used a keyboard, so I'll just kind of move on. But we do must, uh, must understand that, of course, when I type a J or a K or a G or something like this, that J or K or G is not going into memory and eventually storage, right? There's a symbolic encoding. With the keyboard, does anybody remember what encoding is it being, what's being used? ASCII. ASCII. Okay. Unicode will more be, more so be for like web, web applications, right? For, for my little PC here with my attached American keyboard, it doesn't need more than 256 characters. When do we need more than 256? When we're representing foreign languages, the Chinese alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet. So typically we only see Unicode when we move to web applications, to software, something that's going to be distributed. Pointing touch devices. Anybody here never, ever, never use a mouse? Okay, well, kind of move on then. Um, I did bring, and I, I'm sorry, the system is not letting me hook up Bluetooth. I brought a Apple Magic Mouse. Anyone ever use one? A few. Very different. Um, so let me ask first. Did you like it at first? Yeah, I still have it. Uh, okay. I did not like it at first, and now I cannot live without it. The Apple Magic Mouse, the entire surface is a touch surface. So I can scroll, I can click, I can double click, things like that. Pinch and zoom, built right into the mouse. So it works like a normal mouse, but the entire surface is also a touch surface. And it is highly useful, especially if you're reading, the ability to scroll rather than going over and grabbing the page and moving it just with two fingers scrolling is, is real nice. Pen styluses, they're out there. In fact, they've kind of come back into vogue, the Samsung, the, the Surface Pro. Um, I've, we'll look at in a minute handwriting recognition. It doesn't work for me because my handwriting is so horrific. So, and I tend to lose things like pens and styluses. So for me, it's not real appropriate. The text does not present gesture-based and thought-based computing, and it is here. So we'll look at that tomorrow as well. Again, we're going to look at some technologies tomorrow that you've probably never seen before. And I'd like to reemphasize, whenever technology comes out, rarely do we see all of its applications or all of its ramifications, all the negative consequences to it. So as we look at the technologies tomorrow, Keep that in mind because we'll see the technology and you may have an idea we could apply it to this, but also think how could it be used improperly in terms of privacy, things like this. So again, I'm not going to cover mice or pens and styluses. Touch devices, of course, are here. Touch screens, we see them on our phones, things like that. So you can see we're going to move through this chapter real quickly. Scanners. What do we need to know about scanners? Scanners work comparably to cameras, digital cameras. So I have an image. The camera or scanner is going to overlay a grid. And then for each cell, it's going to sample what are the qualities of that cell. And we know that we could use grayscale. And of course, with grayscale, we're only encoding its level from white to black, and this can be done in one byte. We're typically, though, we're RG, we're we're using we're seeing color, so it's being encoded with RGB, red, green, blue components, where each color component will have a byte associated. So one byte for the red, one byte for the blue, one byte for the green, and that gives us our, you know, familiar 24-bit color. Does anybody recall? 
when I move to 32-bit color, obviously I have an extra byte. What's that extra byte being used for? What can it record? Surface quality. Is the surface shiny? Is it dull? Is it transparent? So you can add even more information. So moving to 32-bit color gives a more natural representation. Yeah. Is that like something where you get into the uh, the Lytro light field cameras? No, that's different. No. This is this is still pixel based or roster okay. based. Okay. And we will see the Lytro tomorrow, and I'll, I'll bring one. I have to remember to charge it. Okay. Um, and what he just did. Go ahead. Yeah. My, my question is about the pixels. Mm -hmm. you know, why is that when you take a picture and you put it in there, and then when you try to expand it, they kind of blur? Okay. Well, pixels. Okay. <laughs> When we talk about a pixel, we're talking actually about a monitor, okay? Oh, okay? Whereas when I look at scanners, printers, things like that, it's really what's the grid. On a, on a printer, we're talking dots per inch, things like that. Um, I'm going to give an example of why it becomes pixelated here in just a minute. Maybe I'll do that first, and then I'll talk about the Lytro camera. So whenever we shoot a picture or scan an image, we set... And of course, it's dependent upon the maximum resolution. We will set the resolution. And you get, you get to choose this on your phones. When you, you know, choose a high quality, take a high quality picture versus medium quality versus low quality. So it's, yep, so that'll be in your settings. And those are, that's your resolution. Of course, you can shrink a picture and it looks fine. But if I have a roster or bitmapped image and I make it larger, let's remember what's happening. The camera or scanner will impose a grid, okay? So little cells. And for each cell, it's taking a picture. Now, of course, if I have a, if those cells are big, I don't have very good resolution. And when I make it larger, one cell, in this case, is probably will become 32 or so. So a single cell in this small picture here, it looks like a curved surface, right? Because those are the pixels, pixels. But as soon as you make it larger, one cell will become 32, Okay, big squares of, squ of black, big squares of white. And here you can see the representation, so it's showing you the red, blue, and green components. And this is doing it in percentages. It would actually be a byte each, so it would be from 0 to 255. Now, the Lytro camera. The Lytro camera works very differently. <clears throat> the Lytro camera captures the, captures the light vectors as they enter the camera. We know that we see color based on what, are, what the reflections are from the surface. So the Lytro captures all of this. You don't focus with the Lytro camera. You just take the picture, and it captures all the light vectors entering into the camera. <clears throat> what this facilitates is you can now, after the fact, focus on whatever you'd like. So I could, if I snapped a picture here, I could focus on this Sam Suing right here, or by clicking on with the mouse with the software they provide, focus on that chart over by the door. Very cool. And you think about the applications. And as I just said, rarely do we see all of the applications at the outset. Um, we are launching, by the way, a cybersecurity program. So I've been working with, and I've been working with the local law enforcement uh, community for some time. I work with state police and uh, the inspector generals. And I asked, are they using the Lytro cameras in forensics and in criminal investigations? And they're not. It just shocks me. And I give them the example, and, and as soon as I introduce them to it and give them this one example, they, they're going out and buying them, but the Boston Marathon bombing. If one person had had, had had the Lytro camera, click. None of this, please send us your photos, and we'll send them off to the FBI, and we'll do what we can to get an image. One Lytro camera picture focus on the person in the white hat, APB, 30 seconds later. It's a great application. Incredible. Let's look at the other side. You start putting these Lytro cameras on the roofs of buildings throughout the cities, right, taking one picture a second, every, you know, whatever, two, two a second. Suddenly, you know what? Focus on that person. What's in their hand? What are they doing? What's their facial expression? because now we can infer what they're up to from their facial expressions. You start putting these things on drones and flying them around. 
Lytro just launched a video version, and this will revolutionize film. If you think about what they do with film now, of course, the director sets up the cameras. I want these camera angles. I want this in focus and that out of focus. That's gone. In the perimeter, set up 16 Lytro video cameras. Capture it all. It's all there. Later, focus on this, focus on this. It, it will, it's going to change the world. So anyway, I digress. We, we also need to understand, of course, I just presented bitmap or, or roster graphics. What's the other major category? Bitmapped and roster, what's the other? Vector. Vector. Okay, let's remember what a, ve a mathematical vector is. Mathematical vector is a direction and a magnitude. And of course, it's going to start at some point, so an origin. Very different. Because as soon as I go to vector, what I'm really talking about is polygons, objects. Okay, so now it's object oriented. If you take a picture of something, there's no intelligence in that picture. All the ca digital camera did was overlay a grid, sample those cells. It has no idea that there's a person there, a dog there, a car there. You move to vector-based because now you have polygons and you can actually identify components. So when you look at, and this catches everyone's attention, game programming. Game programming is all vector-based. It's all object-oriented. So in contrast to bitmapped or roster graphics, which, which do not scale well, of course, if you make them smaller, they look OK. You make them larger. They become jagged, pixelated. Vectors scale perfectly, right? What is it? It is a direction and a magnitude. I want to make it twice as large, times two. Same direction, magnitude is twice. So with vector graphics, you can expand with unlimited precision. Precision does not change. Now to change a bitmapped image to vector, what you have to go through is edge detection. And there is software out there that will do that. It'll see the difference in color, so it'll actually be able to extract objects. And this is what's going on with, you know, you see in film, of course, but body language recognition, facial recognition, all of this is based on vector analysis. Readers. I'm not going to say much about readers. We all have them. Anybody have readers on their phones, by the way, barcode readers, things like that? They're great. Um, a couple of years ago, we went Christmas shopping, and we decided to go out to the store. We just took ours and snapped everything. And of course, it comes up with as Amazon for about half the price, add to cart. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was great. Um, when you talk about um, pictures, what's the difference that you take from your cell phone to like a flip flop phone? Yep. You know what I mean? You can't adjust the pictures or anything because it's. The camera says take a picture. Mm -hmm. It doesn't give you any instructions. Mm -hmm. or so, expense. so, right. How do you, when I post it and transfer it to my laptop, mm -hmm. and when I want to expand it, they say it's low or low resolution. Low resolution. So that so is it. You, you, you can't. It, it depends on your phone and the camera. You know, does your phone have optical zoom? Does it have multiple settings for resolution? Things of that nature. So you have to. Yeah, it's going to be right. What's the functionality of your device at that point? Okay. So one of the things, and I added up a QR code here, um, and we're going to look at this down the road when we get to web design. Marketing largely doesn't may or may not realize. It's, it's changing in the big cities. It's changing Boston, New York City. But even locally, Marketers locally still may not understand that marketing is now IT. Okay. Business, marketing, is all about feedback, analytics, closing the loop. And if you look at traditional forms of marketing and advertising, it's broadcast. And you get no information back. Radio ad, newspaper ad, television ad. All of these things are one directional. Where as soon as you involve the customer, and QR codes can do this very well, you actually get information back. And they try to do this, radio ads, you know. Go on to this site and enter the code something, something, something. Because that links you to that whoever is selling that, I know they were listening to this show. 
And if I can get other information, then I can understand their demographics, do profile and things of this nature. So, what you're telling me, uh, I use one of the, the Q, <clears throat> QR codes. Won't they give that company information about myself, personal information? Yes. That's the only <clears throat> issue that mm -hmm. I have. That mm -hmm. I don't want you to know who I am yep. or what I am, but now you, you're forcing mm -hmm. me to do so. Mm -hmm. No, I'm not forcing. It's your choice. Well, how do I know if it's my choice? Because well, then you don't snap it. That's what I'm saying. Yep. Yeah. It doesn't say, it says it's not here, but it doesn't. Yep. Recall what I said. Secu security is 75% policy. You're in control. Okay. You can choose not to snap that. So then no. you can't get into no. like this, this other programs that I went on this weekend and I refused to do so. Mm -hmm. And it took me right off. It deleted me. It, yep. it, it shut me down. It says, well, you said no. Well, bye. Yep. See you. Yeah. So that that's that's, that's different though. Well, that's now we're getting we're getting way off topic into the web and other yeah, things. So, yeah. um, let me give you an example of a good use of a QR code. Crossgate Mall banner ad. Okay, and there's a QR code. Maybe get ten percent off, fifteen percent off, whatever. And of course, when people come by and snap it, it takes them to the website. And the server, the web server. I can do this. I don't do it with CIS100.com, but I could detect what device you're on. Are you on an iPhone? Are you on Android? Okay. I could tell which which version. Things like this. So there's information there. What about time of day? Someone snapping that at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday. Well, what can I infer? Probably not a student. Probably not someone who works in an office. So you know, stay-at-home mom, stay-at-home dad, something like this. I'm. I have predictive demographics there. What if all of a sudden at 3 p.m. I get a slew of these? Schools are out, right? What's the weather? Kids are all, okay? So I can identify target populations. And this is a large part of marketing. What was it, the, uh, the, the Honda Element? You know, remember that car, the big boxy car. And they tried to market it to, um, I forget, and I forget which way it went. They're trying to market to surfers, and suddenly families liked it, or they're marketing it to families, and suddenly they found out that surfers liked it. So this is marketing, identifying a new cohort, so to speak, who wants to see your pro your product. QR codes can be used. This. I just learned that the Joe Bruno Stadium has QR codes on the back of the seats with menu, and you can pretty much shoot the back of this the, the seat. The concession stand menu will come up. You can order right there, and they'll deliver to your seat. Uh, so, again, another use. RFID. RFID chips have been around for a while. Their cost keeps dropping. What they will facilitate, <clears throat> and what a lot of people don't recognize yet, the Internet of Things, where our environment will become sensor-rich. We're going to just start capturing data from everywhere. And recall what I said, this, this new, these new forms or sources of data represent dark data. And I gave the example of Best Buy. They put the cameras in front of the store, and as soon as people walked in, they looked right. Okay? Previously undiscovered information, dark data. They're putting RFID chips everywhere. Walmart uses them. A lot of U UPS uses them. FedEx uses them. And how, how would Walmart use them? <clears throat> give you an example. They have produce, you know, and they're shipping lettuce. And somewhere out in the middle of the country, you know, there's a snowstorm. Suddenly the trucks are all stopped. Well, those trucks were destined for New York. And obviously because of the delay, that lettuce is going bad. So real quickly they can identify, hey, let's divert it to a local store. We'll sell it for pennies. Okay, so be it. But at least we'll recoup some of our money. Okay. And again, we have to look at the good and the bad. And that's what I'm trying to drive home here. A luggage company, real high-end luggage company, started putting RFID chips into their luggage. Now, this is expensive, $2,000. And if you're buying luggage for two or $3,000 a suitcase, you probably have a valet, a, a butler, something like this. Okay, great. So the butler can go to the airport, stand there with a reader, it's going around the track, you know, his reader beeps and there's, there's the luggage. Great. Of course, the crooks realize this. So they got one of the reader. Now all they have to do is walk through the airport. 
BBB? Because if you're buying luggage for $2,000, what do you think's inside that? Okay. So, or who, very expensive, whatever. So again, with, with every new technology that comes out, every new application, yeah, th if they're, they're gonna be good applications. Also think, how can this be, you know, for lack of a better word, corrupted? Um, RFID chips, by the way, they're being used. We're gonna see a big influx into shopping, um, the automated shopping cart. They're using it in California already in, in wine stores. You add a, you put a, the, the RFID chip is in the cork. You put the bottle in your cart, the wine speculator report comes up, also increases the total in your cart so you know exactly what your cart has um, before checkout. And very soon, of course, it'll be automated checkout. You'll just kind of wheel, wheel yourself right out of the door and never never go through a, a checkout process. <clears throat> Oh, Apple Pay. No, yeah. Don't even need well, that. There's also stores that, like, if you download a store's application, like, yes. like the Apple Store does this, mm -hmm. you can go on there and you can scan anything in the store that's, like, customer-facing yep. and pay for it with your Apple Pay, Samsung Pay, Android Pay, and just walk out. Just, mm -hmm. that's it. Yep. It's here. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to say anything on optical mark readers. Optical character, character recognition has been for, around for a long time. It is, it is great. If you don't have a scanner on your phone, I recommend it, especially in an educational environment. The ability to walk into a library, snap a picture of the page and actually have it converted to text where you can then extract that and put a quote right into your paper without ever having to type it again is wonderful. I bought uh, um, a little printer mm -hmm. and take it. It's a wand mm -hmm. and I just wand the page yep. you can do that and too. scan yep. it and yeah. go home and it put it in my computer and mm -hmm. it prints it out. Yep. So yeah. Nice. Yeah. And what they're doing with today's iPhones, um, we'll look at, you know, magnetic ink, but it's the book presents it. It's already been bypassed because of course you can take a picture of your check and just have it go straight in. So there are many good scanners out there for both Android and Apple, free ones. Biometric. And with this, I'm going to present something I did present Day one, we weren't quite ready for it, and I'll represent it again when we get to security. Recall in the first class I presented when you log into Blackboard, what we're actually participating in is that authentication authorization cycle. And really, it's identification authentication authorization. So I input my username and password, identification. I'm identifying myself to the system. The system checks its files. Yes or no, there is a, a user, j.luby, okay? And then it checks its password file. Did this person provide the correct password? Authentication. At which point, it identified and authenticated. It provided me with authorized access to resources. And I'm saying this now as I present biometrics because there are three levels of identification and authentication. The lowest level, of course, is something I know, username and password. A little bit more secure, something I have. I have a, you know, a card with an RFID chip. I have a USB dongle. So I actually have to possess that item. And if I'm doing that, the computer system is typically going to use two-factor authentication. So I put the USB drive in, and I have to do, you put, input my username and password. The highest level of authentication is biometric. Fingerprint retina scan, something like that, something I have. So again, the three levels from low to high, something I know, something I have, something I am. So again, I'll present this again when we get to security, but if you get it down now, it'd be, be beneficial. The retina, yeah. the retina scan, yeah. Very hard to spoof. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. Digital cameras, I'm not going to say anything else about. Again, um, scanners, readers, I'm not going to say anything about. Audio input, one thing we have to recognize with well, audio input and even di um, visual input, it's inherently lossy. Recall there are two types of compression. There's lossy and lossless. We need lossless compression whenever data is involved. 
because it would not be acceptable for me to write a term paper, compress the file, it comes back, half the paper's gone. That's not acceptable. Lossy compression can be used because, again, we're, we're always concerned with the size of these files. I can use lossy compression where human perception is involved. In fact, when we look at video, inherently it's lossy, right? Even analog video, 24 frames per second. It's not capturing the full stream. It's taking a picture every 1 24th of a second. So there's, there are going to be gaps there. But that's enough to fool our eyes. Same thing with audio. At some point, I cannot tell the difference between the levels of, of um, precision. So let's take a look, though, because we often hear, you know, we hear laymen always talk about a bit rate with an MP3 file. Well, when I digitize audio, there's a little bit more than just digitizing, say, a picture. Why? There's a temporal component, much like video. If I think about what audio is, audio is a waveform, right? And it's continuous. And again, it has that temporal component, that time-based component. So to capture it, what the digitization process will be is it will have a sampling rate. In this case, you know, what, what is what we think of as CD quality, 44,000 times per second is going to be the sample rate. You can think of those as the vertical bars. Then I'm going to have what's called sometimes a bit rate or a bit, excuse me, not bit, but bit rate, bit depth, because now I will have certain plateaus. So with 16 bits of precision, it's actually what, two to the 16. So I have 16,000 horizontal lines. So now if I map that, map or, or superimpose that over that temporal signal, I can see where does that line cross at what bit depth, okay? And I'm doing this over and over repeatedly per the sampling rate. So if I look at, say, CD quality sound, 44,100 44, samples per second, 16 bit, bit, bits per sample, oof, two channels, what I'm getting is about 1.4 megabits per second. Okay, so that's the bit rate of today's CDs. That's what would be, would be required. And I want to everyone to remember, when I'm talking about bits per second, I'm talking about lowercase b slash s, whereas when we look at file sizes, of course, it's bytes. So no, no, we know that there are eight bits per byte. So don't ever make that mistake if you're designing a network. Voice input. Now, no, and the book doesn't really present this. Speech recognition, which is what most of our devices do, is very is different, not as complex as natural language understanding and recognition. <coughs> Speech recognition just looks at the phonemes, the consonants, okay, the vowels. There's no extra context. You can't see this, but there's a little plate of glass here up on this table. So if I say, you know, the glass on the table, just because I alerted you to that, there's context. Whereas the computer would not know if there's actually glass on the surface or there's like a glass of water. There's no extra context. That's where natural language processing, because it can actually look at the context of the full sentence. And what it actually does is parses it out. And it goes beyond the sentence level, but actually even into the paragraph and full narrative. So is it, is it the same thing as the dragon? Natural dragon is just speech recognition. Slowly, our systems are getting more natural language processing capabilities. When we move to natural language processing, we're actually moving into artificial intelligence. And to some extent, we're seeing this in Siri, okay? We're seeing it to some extent in Android. And a brief note on this too, because, and I'll present this again when we get to operating systems. Very two different ways that Siri and Android are, are approaching their voice recognition. Android built it into the kernel. And if you recall from the first Linux lab reading, what is the kernel? It's the core part of the operating system. Because it's built into the kernel, Android does not need cell connection to do its voice recognition. You could be out in a meadow, a forest, without any cell and still dictate whatever. Siri, in contrast, requires the cloud. 
If you don't have a good network connection, okay, it's not going to work. It's going to be compromised. Now, why would Apple do that? Their business model. Because they're now capturing everything you say, they can profile you. Very similar to what's taking place with, you know, storage in the cloud and everything else that's going on. Um, Samsung with their TVs and their voice recognition mm -hmm. said, you know, put out some kind of warning saying you shouldn't say sensitive things in front of your TV because it's always it's always listening. Always it's listening. listening. Always, always being stored. And that's actually good information. I'm glad they did that. Um, and we're gonna talk a lot about ethics and full disclosure. <laughs> and it's it's strange. A lot of times companies that do participate in full disclosure, they, they, they take criticism for it because the public's not aware. Google is very forward with their privacy statement. They come out, this is what we're doing, this is what we're doing, and people take shots on them, shot shots at them. Whereas other companies, Microsoft, things like that, Yahoo, kind of keep everything under covers. So they don't take the brunt of you know the, the criticism. Which is, and it comes from, you know, the public be just being naive. So it's unfortunate. Uh, music input, it's out there. Um, I won't go into much. It depends as, as time permits towards the end of the semester, hopefully we'll cover MIDI and things like this in an extra topics type presentation. Um, again, the text is kind of dated. Tomorrow we're going to look at a lot of things. Haptics, the first uh, holographic cell phone is out. And we'll look at that. I don't know if anyone's seen that yet. It's, it's, it's Star Wars. It's Princess Leia standing on your phone. Um, yeah. No, no, but this is, this is real. There's a holographic cell phone. And it's in China. And that's, that should alarm us. We're not first. No, China's always first. No, no, no. That's an incorrect statement. Yeah. Um, so we'll look at virtual reality, augmented reality, all kinds of input and output that will, again, it's it's astounding, what's what's out there and what's coming down the pike. Display device displaces <laughs> display devices. I'm trying to hurry too quickly through this. Everyone's used a monitor. I'll move on. I'm not going to say anything about this. What we do need to understand with devices, of course, is the size and aspect ratio. Okay, resolution, things like this, and again. Video adapters, interfaces, ports. Again, we covered this in architecture and hardware, so we should understand. One thing I didn't, I mentioned, but, and, and more and more, I'm gonna emphasize this. Standards. We need standards. In fact, we need converged standards. 10 years ago, we had a parallel printer port. We had a serial port. We had a PS2 port. We had all these things on the back of our computers. And Apple is actually leading the way with this, you know, just, just converging onto a single port. And we don't even think twice about this. I'll reference that three-prong electrical plug. I can walk into Walmart, Target, whatever, buy a toaster oven, a vacuum cleaner, a microwave, whatever. I don't even think about interoperability because I know when I get home, it has a three-prong plug and I'm plugging it in. I would not be happy if I got home and it had a four-prong plug. So we have this standard, and that's what standards do. They provide us the ability to interoperate with heterogeneous devices. So Apple, of course, is moving to, you know, they, they still keep the USB, but Thunderbolt, okay? And USB, of course, we now have USB printers and USB whatever. So our peripherals have all converged to this single USB. Oh, MacBook. It's got MacBook USB Air. Well, my, my latest MacBook Pro has no CD drives. And it's probably, what, two or three years ago. It was the first. And I actually thought about, can I buy a computer without a CD, CD drive? And now I realize, you know, I think I've used it like once or twice. I have an external one, which is great. So I'm not lugging around that extra weight. Yeah, I get it. Okay, I just didn't know that I'd get it at the time. Um, wired or wireless displays are here. Very nice. But you know, and again, I just stated it's very nice. And I'm going to present this over 
again. We're filling our environment with electromagnetic waves. And when we get to networking, we'll see that Bluetooth, <clears throat> Wi-Fi, cellular, they're all in the microwave spectrum. And we know what we use microwaves for. When we look at medicine, medicine is evidence-based, which means that we collect evidence, and finally we'll see an effect. And then we trace backwards in time what caused that. We get to the effect, and then we look for causality. And the studies have just come out linking cell phone usage to tumors in the brain. And you look at our environment, you know, 1990s, what was our cell service? Pretty bad. Early 2000s, pretty bad. We're going to learn in networking that the bandwidth of a carrier, of a wave, depends on its frequency. So how do we have better bandwidth now from 2G to 3G to 4G? Frequency. Our Wi-Fi has gone from 802.11a to B to G to N, faster and faster, 100 megabits a second. Frequency. Bluetooth, 4.0. It's close to Wi-Fi speeds. Frequency. So we're, we're now inundated with these waves. <clears throat> 20 years ago, 10 years ago, whatever, I open up my laptop, I get one or two Wi-Fi signals. What do you get today? Okay. What do we have now? Verizon, Sprint, t Noble. Team Mobile, um, AT&T, okay? It's people walking around with Bluetooth, Bluetooth headphones. Are you within 30 or 40 feet of them? Okay, you're in their bubble as well. All of these things, we're, we're just continually immersed in an electromagnetic spectrum. Moving on, I digress. Wearable displays, okay? The Google Glass came out, the Recon Jet. We'll look at this tomorrow too. Um, the Windows 10 HoloLens. Was that seen as a failure? <clears throat> I think so, because it was yeah. so expensive. Again, Google came out and marketed it to the masses, and the masses said no. Um, I, I haven't revealed this. In the Navy, I was, I was a search and rescue corpsman. Um, so I was an EM, EMT. And you look at it in these specific niches, OK? The ability to get to a patient with the Google Glass on, slap a you know, chest lead on, because say I'm working on a lower extremity, massive bleeding, whatever, and having the pulse there, rather than every couple seconds, are they still breathing? Are they still breathing? You know, check, check, right. You know, arterial bleeding, okay, I can see, yes, the heart's still bleeding. Um, but in these applications, firefighters, things like this, pilots, it's fantastic. Okay, so, you know, again, they market it for one population, but it has great application in other areas. Uh, the recon jet came out for a third of the cost, about five hundred dollars for sports. I'd love one. I can't. I can't. I can't. You know, I can't buy one. But um, <clears throat> and there are other technologies here. When you look at the Google Glass, they, of course, there's sound to them, and what they're using is bone conduction, mandible. So I don't know if anyone knew that yet. So there's a certain security to to that too, because you're not really hearing it because it's just conducting it in the, in the bone. Um, I have swimming goggles that actually have this. So in the pool, I can swim laps. And the things in my ears always fell out, but the, the bone conduction works. Um, Windows 10 HoloLens is incredible. We'll look at that tomorrow. It's just phenomenal. Um, but yes and no, again, we have to look at the social context. So as I present this tomorrow, did anybody remember or did they ever see the movie Wally? Okay, and we're gonna look at that. All these people just walking around in their own little bubble with, with a holographic you know, display on their face. And, and I have to look at that too, and you know. Um, so, flat panel displays. What's really interesting is these new OLEDs because they're flexible. Um, I don't think I'll have time tomorrow, but they have flexible cell phones out there now which for, if you like bet breaking them, you know. With the, uh, the original OLED, um, OLED uh, Samsung smartphones, the way those screens work is it only turned on certain pixels. So the ones that were lighting up were the only ones that turned on. So I had a yeah. true black ratio, which I thought was I did not know that. Yeah. That's how those work. Better power, too. Yeah. Yep. So if you have like a white background, you're going to burn more power. But if you have like a dark background. There's nothing there. Nothing there. 
Good to know. And especially when you look at, we'll look at mobile throughout this course because that's the way we're going. And mobile has some constraints, input, output, power, processing. So we'll look at this over and over. <laughs> um, I'm not going to say much. I won't say anything about it. Interferometric. Um, they work by mirrors, so they need a light source external. But of course, if they work, you know, in a park or something like that, they require like essentially no power. So I won't say anything about these printers. And again, one of the things I always would have loved to have done would be a purchasing agent for a company just to stay abreast, stay up on all the new technologies and actually make the decisions. Um, and I lead into printers. Of course, there is a difference between consumer printers and commercial. Um, and when, we, when you start looking at that, we haven't introduced this yet. We'll get to it in information systems. We have to be aware of total cost of ownership, TCO, return on investment, ROI, because quite often, total cost of ownership, you can buy something, a cheap printer these days, inkjet printers, but in the long run, as you buy all these inkjet cartridges, it's going to cost you more money. Total cost of ownership will be up. Um, of course, you're going to pay more for the higher resolution, dots per inch. You're going to pay more for color. Okay. Um, I'm not going to say anything about printers, really. Straight, straight. But audio output, we're going to look at a bunch of things tomorrow. Um, has anyone seen vibrational speakers? They're like electrostatic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Martin Logan's, they have a huge display of them up at Best Buy of Magnolia. Really? Yeah, I'm have to go them, in. Uh, hooked up to a Macintosh tube amplifier and mm -hmm. tube preamp and yep. uh, like a Sony music server. No, that's a little different. But, no, like, yeah, yeah, I know. But I'm like the, the actual speakers, yeah. but they've got this whole system. It's like yeah. 40 grand they got set up up there. Yeah. Awesome. Vibrational speakers don't have a tweeter, woof, or anything like that. They have no sound element. What they use, or what they do, is convey the vibration to whatever device they're attached to. They'll turn whatever they're attached to into the speaker itself. This desk, the glass, a wall. Um, relatively inexpensive. The fidelity isn't quite there, but it's actually getting there. MIT is working on it, so, you know, um, I expect Bose will come out with something at some point. So we'll look at that tomorrow too. And they are, they're, they're pretty incredible. So that's it. Um, again, tomorrow is the real fun one. If you know of any emergent, uh, kind of unknown, esoteric input output devices, please email me, send them to me. Let me see, see if they can crack the lineup for tomorrow. <laughs>